thanks so much. Um, it's it's great being back here. Um, it's also great um, to be invited to this series. Apart from that, uh, I will talk a little bit also about the background and the future of some of the things to do with the installation you see in here um, in the Tidalectic show. I also um, want to, yeah, so we planned like about 20 minutes each and then a short conversation and then we hope that everybody joins in as well, right? Okay. So unfortunately, I have to read. Um, so let me, okay, it's good because I wanted to start with this uh, funny dog, which maybe some, some of you have seen recently uh, in Mumbai, uh, the dog that turned blue from, um, Toxic River, and I think this other dog is maybe also wanting to join in for. Okay, let me start with um, Wanda. And with Ava Hayward remembering Rachel Carson, who engaged in creating awareness about environmental justice. She says, who can really afford to be sad about ruined rivers and toxic lands and for what purpose? She writes, let's imagine we have the feet in the ocean. We encounter and touch innumerable organisms, dinoflagellates, radiolarians, diatoms, and other lively bits. The cells are alert to the seawater and its changing salinity, perhaps even absorbing the elements as some of my own skin sheds into the roiling lip of surf. I'm not the ocean, but in this moment, I'm with the ocean. Our differences are obvious and deep, but my own genetic code is fleshly spine of marine legacies. All of us are partly coral reefs, full developing polyps, growing sponges, brooding anemones, and feeding sea snails. Carson used human-like critters to help us envision a decidedly non-human world, same like my favorite sci-fi story in a book called The Drowned Worlds is about a woman becoming a coral. And I have myself invested, and I will do, in the science and the world of the dinoflagellates, their numerous stories to tell, their glow, their toxins, and first and foremost, our relations with them. The dinoflagellates are microorganisms. Sorry, I'm skipping. The dinoflagellates are microorganisms you cannot see by the mere eye and when they're on their own, unless they go wild and bloom or cluster and glow. When you see, uh, as you can see on this one, a uh, little bit bad image, but um, in their bloom, you can be immersed in their community and in their cluster bundle, and then they are really like an alarm system. They're more sci-fi, let's say, than the fungi and cyanobacteria that rule where I grow up in the Franconian woods. And that counterfactual method, that spotlight to look and study dinoflagellates, and especially the bioluminescent ones, has many reasons. But for now, it is with Rachel Carson an attempt to show us nearness and distance, globe, not human and yet not unlike human. Relational, but not exactly identifying. Am I reading too fast? I'm sorry. Is it too fast? <laughs> relational, but not exactly identifying nor representational, what Carson would call empathy. Empathy is to share some sense of what another organism's struggles are. We might say to have empathy is to be ecological, that is, we are part of the ecosystem that constitutes us as we constitute it. We have an investment in the world around us. And again, with Hay Hayward and Carson, it seems useful to remember that despite the fact that we have an old relationship with the world, we are forever in the process of becoming members of the world. And while I'm not sure wonderment is the solution to climate change, certainly there's one solution to such a comp there's not one single solution to such a complex issue. But I do think to wonder, to be curious, to undo our self certainties um, is necessary and it, it, require, it is required from us to analyze the structures of violence. So with curiosity and forensics, we have to ask what is that debt and our obligation to the planet? 
So with this intro, I wanted to get to two points important to my small presentation, to our own skin and even under the skin, as the ocean microbial studies reveal that 73% of all these organisms in, its, in their abundance is shared with the human gut microbiome, despite the physiochemical differences between these two ecosystems. And the second point, the planetary scale of transformation in what Beth calls, and we want to discuss today, the geon to power. Nasa Blumen, one of the Dinoflex, yeah, this is the um, the ice melting where um, the algae bloom is uh, something not only frightening but accelerating um, climate change. Which um, yeah, let's not talk too much about Irma and these things, but it's kind of tough to uh, uh, to not talk about them. But I'm, so I'm scratching it a little bit. My work has always been invested in power struggles of some sort, gender, race, and class-based concepts and materialities that aim for our skin in histories, futures, or their denial in modernities and in technologies. Thanks to the TBA 21 Academy and the Alligator Head Foundation, around the same time last year, I was in Jamaica where the troubled, uh, the troubling hurricane called Matthew miraculously had not hit Jamaica that much as it did ha as it hit Haiti at that time. And I'm not going to talk about that, but what was interesting is that uh, Haiti immediately got the cholera. I mean, something that I, all, growing up in Germany, only knew from the medieval times. In Portland, where Alligator Hat is located, the first day I arrived, someone told me the sea had been so angry that it spit the fish out onto the land. And I started collecting poems from the people um, that wrote about the hurricane. So here's one of the um, dino flagellates. Um, I think they do have something about a, uh, about a planetary scale uh, in their form. And here's the hashtag. So, science fictionality, there's something running. Um, science fictionality from an algae perspective is an attempt to imagine human animal and human matter relationship in a non linear and in a non hierarchical way, in a node way which is connecting points, and all of these points are active, and all of these points are constantly um, interacting on a horizontal way, not in a hierarchical way, which is the structure of um, 3D animation and um, CGI animation, um, which you also see here, which is a little bit of the, uh, the making of, um, of the creatures you have in the Thai dialectic show. Well, I'm not so much interested in kind of making animal experiments and using the the real uh, algae, but uh, I also think that the interaction with technology is something that uh, is bringing us hopefully into uh, the future. Facing the political challenges of climate change, the algae species are especially interesting companion and a dangerous one to immerse with. We have not yet imagined the coming problems and growing inequalities in geopolitics. Extreme weather events are reality now and they follow each other faster than ever. The migration triggered by climate change cannot be imagined in its scope, like the melting of the glaciers has accelerated. No one could predict and we are not even able to deal with the global social world and the masses fleeing from genocide and ecocides at the moment now. So one effect of it will be through climate refugees and migrations across species, the ecocide and the social and economic abyss, we can analyze as implanted in our present. And that will play out between parts of the world affected by sea level rising, glacier disappearing, coastal hazards and the disappearance of coastal parts and islands completely with the rise, de the rise of deserts and drought in other areas of the earth that will render them in inhabitable. The effects of and through political implications of climate change are symptoms of structural violence. 
The subjugation of women and the earth is one and the same. The time-honored enslavement of the feminine now climaxes in the virulent decimation of the biosphere. So our propensity for warfare, violence, and hierarchy will usher this into a long path to ecocide. And the question is, what kind of alliances can we mobilize in art, science, technology, and activism? We already can testify in whatever changes are to happen, algae and the dinoflagellates will play a huge role. As climate change intensifies, communities face grave threats from both droughts and floods. Water management in plants, organisms, and saltification has become central. Marine scientists have warned that the future may bring more harmful algae blooms that threaten wildlife and the economy and called for changes in research priorities to better forecast these long-term trends. Evidence also shows that the destructive blooms called red tides in the past, but more properly harmful algae blooms, are increasingly in frequency and severity. It's a growing concern among scientists that climate change may exacerbate the combined effects of increasing temperature and atmospheric CO2 two are affecting ocean surface temperatures, nutrients, light, and ocean water acidity, all of which affect marine ecosystems immediately and with long-term and still not even imaginable effects spreading. These factors influence not just the intensity of algae blooms, but also their composition. The question is whether climate change will enable harmful species to outcompete other phytoplankton. And the problem in addition to that is that there is not enough knowledge about neither the current nor the future phytoplankton community structure. Recent discoveries have shown the ties from the algae to us via the food chain. How around and inside of us, through the tissue of the shellfish, for example, the algae are and will be connected in an entanglement of otherness and through the tissue, skin, porousness and fluids very physically manifold and possibly intoxicating. So before we move to the concepts and solidarities and notes, as I would like to call them, we need to work on climate change as a hyper object, um, to use Timothy Morton's term. We have to grasp the planetary scale of this as the unfolding of the universe and imaginable consequences, not only at the sea, but the drying out lakes, for example, in Mongolia or Himalaya, the saltification, acidification. In history, salt, in history, salt has shown its toxic potential and spread out reaching humans. Salt and sea, the area in California of desertification desertification and saltification from the salt as such, but it, not from the salt as such, but its domination in the ecosystem, a domination induced and forced. It has been one of the key moments in my life, stepping out of the car onto this whole horizon of salty fish bones cracking under your feet. And it has been used in uh, numerous science fiction films. Um, on the other hand, the saline depth of the ocean is the birthplace of everything. Time has passed from the first climate change refuge summit underwater to broaden the ethical gap. Slow violence is even more creepier than the Green Belt movement has foreseen. The entanglement with all our skin, including other species and elements as well as biomass, is why climate change affects us all. So we, rec we also recognize that there's not such a logical dealing with it. We are lacking laws and science, measurements and technology, as well as the consciousness and the means to deal with it. So one, one thing is that there need to be stories to be told, practices as world making and enhancing to pay more attention um, and to also use dreaming as a method I would suggest as an artist and uh, a lot of science fiction writers, as well as Ernst Bloch and the Carabin Film Collective suggest um, to use art to make visible what is not visible and to connect subjectivities. The microclimate in the Himalaya, for example, where magma heats water bubbling from within the earth 
only algae and bacteria can live. And they also color the water, maybe as a vision of what the first stages of a livable planet is and has been and throws us into what is life and who can decide what is life. Like in a sci-fi novel, the algae are the step to terraforming and what Haraway calls world making. And like the mangroves, they witness environments enhancing life. So perception is in the interaction of things, the entanglement of matter, a living and a non-living kind. And these specific dynamics, materials and processes are a form of life. Lots of creatures and critters like the brittle star and the Scorpio, whose body is a complete eye, function through communication with their environment via tactile navigation and highly complex sensing systems. Vision, sound and embodied tactile reaction play together in a very coded and interactive way, especially the dinoflagellates as multitudes and assemblages, they negotiate between the living and the non-living between plant and animal. Like the coral, they're marked and designed and assigned to virtuality more than the oculus and connect to fractal thinking and being a material. Which sounds like a sci-fi trajectory, but one that is real as well and based crucially on transformation and immersion. In a non-linear existence, as marked by virtuality, matter imagined with contingency and possibility rather than necessity and, uh, and, de and consequences. The microbiologist Lynn Margulis in What is Life defines life as a different thing for each of the kingdoms, for bacteria, protists, animals, fungi, and plants, lining out very different paths, but all through emphasis on embodiment, which has become a key asset for artificial life research, the learning and the sensing machine is still a goal, but necessary to overcome the problem of singularity and time-space matter is embodiment. So what is the establishing and organizing form behind life? A code, which one? The DNA, a note, or an algorithm on its own? This immediately reaches a political implication. When, someone allow, when is someone allowed to suicide? Which forms of life can we quietly push into ecocide? And who survives in the jungle of Calais? Which plants will be mass produced in 50 years as they are needed for new antibiotics? The old ones became useless. So here comes the dinos, a bit of a making off from the installation that you see. Bioluminescence is a topic that connects working with a broader ecosystem and concerns around light and body, as well as our relation to technology and energy, energy resources. Bioluminescence is the ability of an organism to produce energy and light. Different to fluorescence in scorpions, for example, they are only visible under ultraviolet radiation. It can be perceived by the human eye in many creatures corals, fireflies, jellyfish. They glow with their bodies, and this is, um, they glow with their bodies um, and actually with their skin uh, due to reactions of their protein based um, in their skin. The dinoflagellates are a large group of flagellate eukaryotes that are there are maybe over a thousand species. Most of them are marine plankton, but they are also common in freshwater habitats. Their population are distributed depending on temperature, salinity, or depth. Many of them are photosynthetic, but at large fraction are also in fact mixotropic. That means like they decide how they reproduce. Some species uh, all of them are protozoas, and they actually produce in uh, in a variety of uh, versions, resting stages called cysts. And this is also why they can sleep in the glacier ice and all of a sudden wake up and create um, new diseases. The process and the reasons behind the glow that you see in this um, in this one is not completely investigated, but it functions as a kind of alarm system for other species and a form of communication. Some bioluminescent plankton is toxic 
and actually there's an increasing number um, to be discovered. Their, their systems uh, are highly complex and I would call them magical. They perfectly fuse the distinction between science and science fiction. It visualizes that neither culture nor nature are timeless. The opposite, our understanding of nature and culture, subjectivity and technology is dependent on interactions. Even for a cyborg, the state is electronically excited and dependent on interaction with energy resources. Bioluminescence occurs ubiquitously in the ocean as planktonic forms, which are largely responsible for the sparkling, commonly seen at night when the water is disturbed. The organisms act also as a touch screen when you have them in the bio lab or when you swim in them. Um, and at the same time, there's some of the first life forms of this planet, and it's this complexity that is the key for understanding the multiple effective layers, the complex temporal variables, and the internally contradictory time and memory lines that frame their embodied ecosystem. In times of natural and unnatural catastrophes, as well as biohacking, we are all aligned with this code. Like the brittle star, the sensing system of the dinoflagellates is unbelievable complex for something without a brain, because as single cells, they don't have a brain. So in struggling for a future of the planet with a better sensing mechanism and empathy, we should be working on imagining and dreaming with extended knowledge systems, like the ones from the dinoflagellates or the ones from the community of humans that live and have been living since ancient times with them. The spirits and the rituals as well as their DNA. So this was someone who actually um, investigates the DNA and this is someone who investigates their navigation system because from, for a lot of the fishermen, the dinoflagellates have been used as a navigation system in the ocean um, with the little boats. Um, so they already functioned um, for a long time as a, as a technology. So this is where uh, I want to kind of uh, stop and only list these um, uh, these qualities and things that we should um, maybe that we can learn and where I will uh, invest and a lot of people around me are investing in algae research um, because they do show the survival in non-earthly conditions way better than we do. They could be helpful seismographs and measurements for not only climate change, but also for, uh, uh, for tracing pollution and uh, being used as forensics. They are mere energy resource. I think Germany has presented and uh, there has just been an energy summit in uh, Kazakhstan where, where Germany presented algae as the future of um, energy resource because we don't have to make so much war around um, the production. They are um, a key element of transforming living and non-living matter. That also shows that each matter matters, I think, um, that would also uh, make life on the planet easier. The assisting behavior is studied for traces of climate change, as I mentioned before, um, which is definitely uh, one of the urgent topics um, with all of the bacteria waking up. Um, technologically, the study of single cells uh, is helping artificial intelligence in mapping with a feedback as the morphology of the dinoflagellates, for example, has a complex cell covering called amphysma or cortex composed of a series of membranes. And that is actually also um, why I modeled them in the way that they look now like the um, little planets. And they have uh, their mapping and feedback um, system is way ahead uh, and can be used for um, helping robots to map out with a better uh, feedback. 
The navigation system I already mentioned um, is one of these um, things where the ancient and the future technology is connected, the same like uh, what Jerry talks about in the Tidalactic show, um, the, the, the healing of the skin um, effect. So that uh, is maybe something where I end the connection between different knowledge systems um, in the ecosystem and the non-timely aspect. Uh, can I hand over? I have more than my own. Am I on? Yes. Okay. Uh, I can't see you guys at all. It's so weird. There's this big sun staring at us in the middle of the night. Um, it's going good. I'm going to speak for a little while and then hopefully we'll begin a conversation. Yeah, it's going? Yep. I don't know. Um, so, water and land water, fresh or salt water, land, desert, or bog, and of course also air and air and sky. Um, how easily, just an everyday conversation, we can slip into feeling and thinking and referring to these material spaces as divisions of a form of being and existing that touch and press and undulate against each other. The surface of the water, the depth of the land, the surface of the land, touching the expanse of the sky, the surface of the air, touching the void of space. Now all three are earth, water, land, sky. That's four. <laughs> ah, the jet lag. All three may be seen, may seem to many, and often do, different forms of non-living, a non-living medium that various forms of life can traverse or not with or without specific technical means of maintaining its life long enough to, long enough to, long enough. And here longevity for some things transforms these sets of divisions Water and land, and in sky, transform these sets of divisions into perhaps a set of oppositions. The medium, earth, land, sky, water, the medium seems to determine for many which beings can be and for how long, and which beings become anomalies outside their proper space. That is, for many, water and land, fresh or salt water, land, desert, or bog, air, high, low, heavy oxygen, none at all. For many, these seem to determine what is life, what kind of life, and which ones thrive. The deep medium then acts, for many, as the inert, and yet determinative material against which we value, judge, and distribute life. And here the inert means in, the, in a sense of a geontological sense, the inert signals for many in the West a form of non-life beyond, maybe before, death. So in English, Unfortunately, we can use non-life as a term to refer to that which has died and is now no longer alive, but also to that which came into being, we think, we act as if we thought, came into being 
inert, never having been alive. That is, the inert for many refer to the stone in which the fossil is lodged or the ice in which we find a mummified Alpian traveler within. That is, for many in the West, life seems defined by way of these non-life inert mediums, which non-life medium provides the natural conditions for which form of life, or how which form of life can ambulate, can res respirate, can reproduce, can engage in its specific developmental processes. Think here of the salmon or the whale, the fish or the mammal. Think of disciplines like marine biology versus terrestrial biology. And they determine these divisions, which we set up now as oppositions, water and land, land and sky, water and sky, seem to determine which of these forms of life become anom anomalies, special cases. Beings, live beings within mediums that their kind normally don't attend. Here we can think of way back in Aristotle days, who called Aristotle called these dual creatures like whales. Well, what are mammals doing in a medium to which they don't belong? But for many in the West, what seems most definitive of the difference between Earth and sea and sky are not their, the way in which life ambulates or reproduces, but rather the way in which these mediums provide respiratory constraints on forms of life, air or oxygen, means of breathing or respirating. Underwater alone within my unadorned body, I cannot breathe. When people find themselves in radically disoriented spaces, they become like a fish out of water. But note here when we say, ah, I am a fish out of water, note how we once again find ourselves focused and dividing then between life and the medium in which it's located. Whether hostile, that medium is hostile or beneficial to itself. We act in the West, and, and again, not in, say, the work that many of us are doing, but outside of it. We act in our ordinary gestures as if a law of nature creates the possibilities and problematics of respiratory movement and maneuver. But what if we understood this law of medium the law of the inert, as within the law of movement and maneuver, the law we consider the law of life. As itself entangled in maneuver and movement as much as that which moves through it. If we understood medium, salt water, air, land, as a maneuvering, then every existent, sand, saline, is internally composed of what is otherwise seen as its medium. After all, I must get water and air within me if I'm con to continue to exist terrestrially. But air and water must get through me and my respiratory partner, plants, to remain this or that sort of water, more or less saline, more or less lead, mineral, chemically filled, to remain able to form and accumulate in ponds, Water needs puddles and lakes and sidewalks. And wind depends upon the movement of gases or charged particles from the sun through space. While planetary wind is the outgassing of this light chemical element from the Earth's atmosphere. Thus wind needs atmosphere. It needs sky, sky touching space. Suddenly no touchings, no divisions, but rather they're not touching each other. They're not surfaces or skins that meet and undulate, but rather earth and water and sky are entanglements of extimate existence, the distribution of effects of power and affective power, and the multiplicity of forms of event forms and horizons. That is the inert What are you gonna do many, at that flare? And here we can name names. Or no, or let him or no. Oh, the light of will get a broad, big fine. We don't want to safety here like that boat. Suddenly, the inert seems vital well, what insofar as it's entangled in that which we consider life. 
And yet, is the inert vital? Because everything is vital. That is, are we going to transform all forms of existence into one form? Into the form that we think ourselves to be vital, lively, constrained by medium, by breath, by respiration, and ultimately by death. If not, what kind of axioms do we need that don't come from the West, but perhaps come from spaces such as my friends in Australia and colleagues? Places in which one form of being is not considered to be the measure of all forms. Life, the vital, the affective is not considered to define all other forms of existence, sand, etc. What kinds of weird axioms do we need? get to something that doesn't always look for a deep, medium, inert, and through which life flows. Three strange axioms that I'd, I'll put on the table is first this. Nothing is inert, but not everything is vital. Having the powers of effective, effective maneuver and the ability to move is not to be vital. To be frozen in place is not to be inert. Second, the nothing and the not everything, that is, nothing is inert and not everything is vital, is always in an eximate relation to each other. And third, that the general claim that nothing is inert and yet not everything is vital can never be understood in the abstract, but only in complex forms of horizontal entanglements of what exists among us here and extended out there now, 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 now. Take, for example, an event I wrote about years ago. A school teacher who visited a 66-year-old woman, indigenous woman, who is dying maybe of old cancer time. in a community oh, from which the cotter being come. The teacher entered a door, entered the yard, sorry, and went to the we door, opened the door, and saw Did before her country? in a cinder block house where the old woman was dying, a series of rooms unfurnished except for old stained mattresses on the floor where dogs with scabies sometimes slept, a single steel frame bed in the front of the room, a wobbly table on which stood a broken television set. In the condition, in the kitchen, she could see through the door carcasses of various animals and fish, open jars of jam, loaves of bread, sugar, tea, bowls, and pans with day-old remainders of cooked food, and running through all of it, dozens and dozens and millions of various sizes of cockroaches. The toilet, you could smell, had been backed up for weeks, etc. Frozen and inert, she stood on that door and did not work. And instead, when able to compose herself, left and shifted what she considered to have frozen her onto those who froze her, saying that the conditions she saw were not of her own settler earlier, but rather of the dysfunction of indigenous people there. She found herself unable to breathe, and she wanted that inability to be transferred elsewhere. Or go to Rochester, New York, where the great Kodak factory is undergoing a controlled demolition and a phase reorientation. The material Today, state control of indigenous lands. Kodak Can I help you? Emerging Somebody even locked that gate here. What? Uh, and primary uh, look, I don't know why somebody locked the gate. As a chemical seep into the ground, yes. the yes, water. Yes, you have to have the paperwork the, filled out. You the, have to have an anthropologist go over your claims. Tanks. The glass. Oh, the glass I'm going to ask them people to go to my These own These spaces uh, are look, not spaces look, in which the they are either the inert country. or merely well, vital. How am I supposed to But rather a set of powers that continue to be in the transfer. The effects of being frozen, of not being able to breathe, of being constrained or moved, of being transformed or left <laughs> like chemicals in, in chemicals.
question of what kind of political imaginary do we need when poisons, saline, sands, as well as bodies such as my friends, glowing bacteria in the oceans, all constantly have to exchange forms of inert, forms of movement. And yet these neither define one kind of existence or another, but rather are only constantly transferred transfer to each other. If, a, if the poverty of settler colonialism freezes a woman otherwise considered vital with the powers of movement, how does she transfer that powers of inertness? If PCPs want to spread, but are themselves inert? How does it use and piggyback? If the toxins that might become the red tides in Suzanne's and others' bays want to continue and is spread, how do we allow or disallow them? To what other forms of sanding, touching, and undulating? And these are just clips from out of it. Did you rain just put that there? No. We have, That's well, I can't see anything. Yeah. yeah. Go well, we could, we, we, we somewhat had a plan. Both of us are, are interested in, um, after, well, probably, you know, I might, M more, more uh, in some ways, more than you. I know, I can't. Hello, everyone. Can we turn this thing a little bit? <laughs> um, trying to think about uh, politics, um, environmental politics, and for me, of course, social colonial politics. Um, after or while the uh, the, the common sense divisions of life and non-life start uh, deteriorating, being shaken apart. Um, uh, for for me, the, the the image of a fossil in a stone captures what's at stake here. So. Um, uh, and call, and it captures what's at stake for a number of reasons. A, the, we always look at the fossil, not the stone, because the stone is the, the deep medium, often considered like, you know, it doesn't have the possibility to be alive, so it can't die, so it doesn't have the drama of life and death, um, whereas the fossil does. But also because the stone um, and our, uh, our treatment and our Kind of the deep critical encounter with the stone as that which never had the possibility to be alive and therefore cannot die and thus there's no drama of finitude um, becoming etc um, lodged within itself is also the way in which my colleagues in Australia are measured in their primitivity so that they believe that stones um, have the powers to sense their movement, to respond to them, to a certain kind of agency, places them into a either positive or negative um, evaluation of being primitive. So you could say it's great that they believe that, or it shows that they're badly primitive, but it's still a measure. So, so I, I think, you know, it's what do we, A, what do we do in terms of environmental and social politics when I think neither one of us want to hold on to that division between that which is inert and that which is vital. So maybe we could start there. And what kind of political concepts do we need afterwards? Yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. But I also, I also think, um, 
you know, having been inspired by uh, your work and writings from the other two books too, but especially from the last one, um, and speaking as an artist, I think one way is looking for new methods and new terminology connected to e maybe also some kind of experimenting, um, not necessary in the scientific way, but in the way of you know, listening to other things that we have not listened to or uh, dreaming and coming back to um, uh, maybe what the saltwater dreaming and also in your book uh, uh, comes out as one of the key concepts is this, this word of um, embankment. So when you give the example of the fossil and that we, we just have been concentrated on the fossil and not what was around or, you know, we're extracting the oil, but we haven't looked into all these long processes that had made the oil um, possible and and when it's it's gone there won't, you know how much time is so one is the the terminology um the new methods and another thing this um bringing in time scale or thinking about time in a different way that um is not connected to progress i mean maybe that sounds a little bit more chaotic than um academic but for me this word embankment that you're using has a lot of this. So, for example, what, what can politics or what, where have, do we have to start is finding new concepts. And I, I have always been trying to use uh, solidarities or alliances, which is super problematic. And it's, uh, you know, what some people don't understand because they think it's old fashioned. Or, Da, 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 yeah. and it also sounds funny, yeah. you know, solidarity yeah. with the algae is kind of like, hmm. <laughs> when I wrote that, uh, when I read that, somebody writing about the work, I thought like, oh, but still, it's that's what it is. It's like different connections. Um, and I think like one, one thing is like new concepts, which is... Yeah, the, 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 uh, maybe backing up just a second. So... <laughs> No, no, it's good because we we can't uh, suppose that they have read anything I've written. They've at least gone to the show where you've been in, which is great. Um, there's, there, the, you know, we all know. Well, a lot of us know that, like Berardi and others have argued for. We need to find new ways of solidarity. We need solidarity with other all forms and other forms of life. And what could be wrong with that? That's got to be right, right? And it's algae, and it's uh, fungi, and it's grass, and it's it's uh, uh, whatever you see over here, which is uh, so far we're only seeing. If you could see, you'd see all kinds of snails down there too. And of course, we get a little queasy when we say, "Well, but wait a minute. Um, what about forms of like the red tide?" The red algae, but well, not that form of life, right? So, so immediately we start think, oh, you know, we say we should have new forms of solidarity, uh, or we have should have solidarity with all forms of life, and then very quickly, I think politically, and not surprisingly, we start going, well, not that form, right? Because that form is, is a form that is not going to let my form continue in the form that I've grown accustomed to, right? Like it's, I'm going to start exploding and vomiting and blood coming out of my nose, and I don't want that. Or I don't know what happens if I get to buy red algae. So I don't want that. So we start deciding which form of life, and then we're you know we're back in a more regular politics um, of of solidarity. Um, I think. Which is not a bad thing. I just think that we have to like confront that. It's like, well, it's not all forms. Or, um, and a second thing happens for me, which is the division that has uh, the division between life and non-life, but not dead non-life, not life that's become dead. Rather, the rock and the fossil. What are you gonna do at that flat? has been so fundamental oh, no, to no, not no, only no. the way oh, in which our the Western epistemologies have been um, like constituted, but also the way in which uh, Western politics has been constituted. So there's just a hierarchy. It's like, you know, rock, forms of, 
forms of life, humans, and humans with logos, and that kind of pulls out one form of life, and we're all like, well, we have to attack that back. But also measuring different kinds of people according to how they think about the division between non-life and life. And so two things happen. Why do we keep on holding on to this division? And what does it do when we hold on to it? How does it function? How does it parcel out people, etc.? But why are we holding on to it when you and I and many people are keep saying the division between the inert and the the vital is not true, right? It's it's it it's a difference that makes no difference. I like. It's all, you know, in your talk, it's all entangled. It's extement existence in the Lacanian sense. Um, but, but then what do we do? What kind of, if we're not going to say life and life is defined by a skin that allows certain kind of organisms to, you know, have that, that Western philosophical potentiality, like to be or not be before I die. Right before I extinguish, then what do we do? And how do I have solidarity with what's already inside of me? I mean, it, and that's why in, that's why embankments, paling, strainings, because an embankment is kind of like a skin, but not a skin. An embankment can can be used to describe sand mounds as well as this is an embankment. Right? So, so th that's a long digression, but it's trying to give some background. Yeah. But maybe you can say a little bit more about it. I mean, asso associating, I would also say embankment fits, let's say, the environment, because obviously this is something, and it, it fits like catastrophes or preventing, to thinking about embankment is also something to rebuild the mangroves so that there can be more coastal protection in, in the environment, plus the the, uh, the real embankment of, you know, moving sand in, in, in Bangladesh to keep things from falling down or, or keeping uh, hurricanes out, which might not be possible. Well, that's right. But, but unlike a skin, unlike the way we think about algae as like having those lipids or membranes, so when Susanna is talking about the, the particular kind of membrane that these algae have, that, you know, it's very interesting. Um, or you have skins, I'm imagining, that of you which we can't see sitting in those chairs. And, I have skin and you have skin, <laughs> so that's our lipid, and you know, and and all forms of life are in some ways defined vis-a-vis -vis its skin. So that's when we can say, well, that has skin. The skin is what makes it n existent, right? And when we think that way, we can easily fall into the trap. Well, I can just move this one around there, and the background doesn't change. I can just move me over there or you over here or that over there and this the skin gives you this false sense that you've just picked up something and put it somewhere else which i know you don't think and i don't think an embankment you have to pull something for you that sand from bangladesh sand is getting to be a very rare commodity because we're digging it up somewhere and we're putting in, and so you focus on the digging out as you're putting in, right? You're focusing Today, on state the, control of indigenous the, lands. Can I help you? Extinguishment is wrong, but somebody you're focusing on the gutting of yeah. one place. What? Uh, look, I don't know why somebody loves the game. To constitute another place. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you have to have the paper. And if you want to constitute this you place, to you want to keep those floodwaters from uh, from the, the, the saline floodwaters from, uh, from look, look, it's the law. engulfing the country. Uh, fresh wetlands. How am I supposed to know it's your country? You're going to have to make another place different. I can't hear and you. I think that changes our politics because you don't have a, you cannot have a, no, so you can't just pick up and move. You're, you, you're changing everything. So which one are you going to do? Because you can't do it all.
That's what the films keep looking at, is that depending on where people place these toxins, how they embank them, will depend on whose bodies are inhabited by what kind of dreams. And, you know, I know that's what you, you know. You, you think about. So one of the things that I may be past is how to think about solidarity. When to have solidarity in one place, keep it in place. You're going to necessarily displace somewhere else. What am I? I mean. I also agree that we have to move away from the term, but also, you know, I, I see these terms as something where it's a part of the ladder, like you're moving to, you move to like concentrating on what are actually the dynamics that are needed. You use the terms to kind of come to these dynamics. So, you know, also like skin, for example, in the, in the, uh, in the CGI or also in, in, in feedback, that is a, is that is something that's like a measurement and uh, that's kind of a mapping tool. The same, like for example, the dreaming maybe can be or um, different kinds of consciousness. So I I do see more connected to let's say the term of skin, but also the terms are like something that I want to move through. Like sci-fi is something where to think through or to go somewhere else. Um, not not as a means uh, as such. If you're gonna go in, no, Does that no, make sense? No. Should we ask, uh, ask for it? You you but we also, off, you, you know, know, if someone has like a question, that would also be nice because we... Um, no? No one? We go on here forever. I mean... Ah, there's a hand. We have a question. Don't go too fast. I'm taking into the car now. Lock him up. Think it's right? Yes, I think it's right. One goes more further. Oh, shit. What I'm going to do? You two will take him back like Morikan and I'll meet them or this hell I swam. Yep, that's right. Ben, will you fight? Hey, if I get that ball, we'll go fishing like it's creek or what? When we get paid. Fella, how much you owe you? Fine. 1,332 cents. Um, how much you owe now? My colleagues have an opinion, um, and my opinion it aligns pretty closely with their opinion. Um, I, I'll just say just two oh, words about what you're seeing here um, and then answer it. This is uh, the second film we did uh, called Rinjira Maru and translated into, it should be translated into the stealing butt hole, but we translated into the stealing cunts because we thought in English that took the bite. Um, it's Winjara means stealing murders. Anyways, I don't know why I'm going on about that, but um, and this was uh, this the the film was uh, uh, the plot of the film was begun because the way we do things was begun by um, four young guys who wanted to make a movie about finding two cartons of beer in the bush and being chased by police, and then. Slowly, other people added to the plot. So, by the end, it was those four young guys find two cartons of beer in the bush, while another young guy is looking after a dreaming site nearby, and while miners are illegally mining right next to that dreaming site. Um, and in the film, the miners are bribing two of the indigenous guys to get access and the indigenous guys are doing it because they're just sunk in quality of life fines which is very common in the u.s and australia um the the reason 
I mean, it's interesting that yeah, it's a great film and all that. But it's also interesting because we some of these signs that you see in the film are actual signs that were in the landscape. So we just went up to them and we filmed around them. Other signs we 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 made, for instance, the one at the fence that says uh, "Stop Poison." We just painted that at that fence line. Um, but as we shot that scene. Uh, after we shot it, we went out into the road, which was nearby, and real police were there, who, and I've written about this, but there were real police who then asked us if we had entered this particular piece of land illegally, and we said no, and he said, did you cross the fence? And everyone grew up here, and we've always crossed those fences. And we were like, no, we didn't go into that place with the sign. We went over there. And he said, well, that's part of it. That's part of the place you're not allowed to go. And everybody's been going there since they, like, were, like, you know, born. Um, subsequent to that, we find out that, in fact, there was, there was PCP in uh, Festos, a um, damnation there from not mining in this case, but from military installations during World War II. So, long story. The Karbing answer to your question about what do they think about mining is that they do not buy the claim that mining tailings can be banked. And just as when they are in the landscape, they're continually sweating into the country in ways perceivable and imperceivable. Also, like, you know, when you're walking, you leave a path. When you sweat, you leave sweat in the country. You can see some of it. You can see the path you make. You can't see the sweat in there. So mining leaves endless tailings that then become thick in embankments that slowly affect not only themselves, but the very nature of the dreaming itself. So that's why the dreaming is in psychedelic colors, because the dreaming is also has been affected chemically. Um, so the question they ask is, why is that the trade-off? That you can have education and contaminated lands, or no education, and what they say is, and contaminated lands, because they're going to rob your country either way. But what's at stake in seeding? So that's a very, it's a very politically treacherous moment. And there are some indigenous elders who are on the side of mining. There are many, many, many who are not. You guys think you're alive? <laughs> oh, there's there there are, I think four films that are showing it. This is the first one. Um, when the Dog Sock. All of the films uh, attempt to do many things, but let's say three things. One, they, they, they show the um, unavoidable entanglement of settler law and um, settler colonialism in not only, you know, their lives, like they continue to be confronted and counter have to deal with settler law and settler colonialism. Um, what do you want to do with that flag? But or no, or the way in which it's not a confrontation, it's an entanglement that doesn't, stuck, yeah. doesn't negate the dreaming, but rather entangles it in a certain way. So that when you get to this film, uh, which is 
so yeah, order drinks. From a best it must be it's and I I didn't do the beginning of it, but oh, it starts with three bro, positions. And yeah, yeah, Jojo, who is is talking here, is right there. There's a boat that breaks down, and there are three people arguing about why it broke down in the very beginning. One position is that salt water corroded the wires. One position is that ancestors, who are now dead and in the land, were punishing them because they hadn't visited the country in a long time, so they broke the wiring. And then Jojo argues that Jesus broke the wire to test their faith, faith to see if they would pray to Jesus and Jesus would fix the wire. So all of the films begin by saying, you think there's an opposition of these positions. Science, ancestors, Christianity. But in fact, by the time you get to the end of the film, and by the time you get to the end of all these films, there's not an opposition, there's an entanglement. There's an inevitable, continual recreation of all three of those positions. Just like there is a continual recreation of the forms of existence that we would divide as life and non-life or the inert and the vital um, by this, this practice of keeping the dreaming going, the practice of mining and the technologies of science and the practices of settler law and disenfranchisement. And to try and parcel them out um, and to argue that they are parceled out is part of the way in which Tarbin say that settler colonialism is happening. So here at the end, the Jojo who was arguing about, arguing that it was Jesus, is told by the ancestors to go get a priest. <laughs> and then she's arguing with them that they should be the ones helping her. So you see this weeping that is what the dreaming is. We are alive. Did you pull out that country? The first time I was in that country, it was when we were punishing me off. We've been beaten as a country. No one helping me, but to all a priest can help me, mum. Keep up, she be trying to help us. We need to go back home, Louis. Tell me, no kid is leaving behind. We can't swim in two pots. If you want to sing that, people are going to help you, mum. Anything you sing that, and then we can help you. Come on, mum. G'day, State Control of Indigenous Lands. Can I help you? Somebody even locked that bloody gate here. What? Uh, look, I don't know why somebody locked the gate. Yes, yes, you have to have the paperwork filled out. You have to have an anthropologist go over your claim. Ah, uh, I'm going to ask them people to go to my own country. Uh, look, look, it's the law. Own country? Well, how am I supposed to know it's your country? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Hurry up, 
That is very short. I mean, the the the, the ancient ancient part is on the one hand knowing specifically where knowing where specific beings are. That's the one which ones are dangerous. But the ancient traditions in Australia. <laughs> Are, is a framework for understanding how, I mean, it's going to sound like I'm saying it, but how, it's the best way, how distance you know, they constantly leave behind parts of themselves as they go along, and as they go along, how places in which you're going along leave parts of themselves in you. And so that's the ancient framework. And, and thus with science, since in the ancient times there were no PCPs at all, there's a, there's a, a working with science within the framework of this knowledge and within the framework of specific places and an insistence that science understands the effects of climate change and toxicity, so anthropogenic climate change and anthropogenic toxicity, vis-a-vis -vis their understanding of how when you go along, constantly leaving parts of yourself and absorbing parts of yourself. You're going to go in? No, I'm not going in there. You but I mean, I also, I also think that this is something where, you know, not the art can be useful, but um, something with knowledge systems that uh, is easy for, let's say, science fiction, for installation, for, you know, you editing. I think like your way of editing also shows that you, you don't allow like one form of knowledge to kind of take over, but you put them parallel. So I think th this is something that, uh, you know, is enjoyable across uh, media and, and maybe is also necessary to to kind of like not have a, uh, a one-dimensional or a one-timeline uh, perspective in, in science. Like some of the work around the, uh, that is in here, but uh, also in the future, so I'm working with a scientist who investigates on the toxins because the toxins have also been found out to be um, healing cancer so in a way there's like a, a weird time loop yeah, which really you know fun. Jerry talks about the healing power yeah, it's then it's like been forgotten polluted really and then you find again when they come back in their wrath and kind of in their toxin yeah, that I'm also going. in this toxin there's something that we need because cancer is one of the um, so to me it's also related in the, that Art can kind of mix up these knowledge forms in a productive way. I don't know if that answers uh, the really question. Yeah, but, but I think that's that's exactly right. Is that is that at least for many, but definitely the Carabig, but many many indigenous people in Australia. Um, it's the it's it's the experiment to figure out how not to make these into a hierarchy, that there was the past and how do you keep going in the future and that now there's modernity and it's, it's like how do you since all these work together how do you find a way of politically but also artistically and aesthetically showing that imbrication right? you know jerry i'm the, the it had the healing qualities before but what was before is not now. So those things in the ocean are not what was there before, right? Yeah, that changed, right? And and so the question is, you know, do we do we say well then tradition has to change, or was there a framework that he was working with that allows tradition? to be about change. So that's not tradition and change, but tradition was always about things are changing. How do we understand that change? How do we manage that change? The 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 bays were not inert until settler colonialism. 
They were, yeah, exactly. They were alive. They were actually in in some places in Puerto Rico. They were called uh, for like help against the colonial powers. So there were rituals to kind of bring the bioluminescence uh, into force against the, the Spanish in in Puerto Rico, for example. So there has also not been like a single timeline uh, in that sense. They were. Um, and they were not inert, like you're saying. Yeah. I think that's. I think that's part of it. It's like, how do we think about these ancient traditions, as, as as creative, innovative, mobile, as any other form of knowledge. Yeah, and and also you know value them not like something that oh that can be in the arts and that can be you know looked at as little decoration but that is actually really valuable let's say in terms of science or in terms of technology which is something odd because also a lot of scientists for example are not used to this uh, does that make sense but th also I mean like in terms of like how do we change that for uh, the future how we give how do we give that more agency in terms of fracking or uh, in terms of uh, protecting the bay uh, not to become um, extinct in the in the healthy bioluminescent ones? Um, I also think that we need to think about this uh, the, the scale of that. Um, like I said in the beginning, that's connected to uh, how entangled this is. So not to think like, oh, you know, here it doesn't affect us that uh, this coral, like we've seen with the coral reefs, like in a way the bays are similar, like, um, you know, there maybe have been 10 of the healthy, super glowing um, bays 10 years ago. Now there are like four left and they are already getting, um, so it's also, we've seen it with the coral reefs. So why can there not be like a faster action? So. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally makes sense. I'll now I, I'll I went say, too no, 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 I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, uh, repeat something that a friend of mine, an older indigenous friend of mine, said to an environmentalist like a couple months ago, actually. And I'm just very curious how you react to it. So, because, you know, the, the coral roofs are disaster. And there was a, a wonderful young guy, just really great, truly. And he said to, over, he said, you know, how, how did y'all, how can what you, you guys know about, because it's salt water, about tides and marine coral help solve this problem? And over just, he was, he's so funny, he looked at him and he said, you know, when we were taking care of the coral, there weren't inter-ocean shipping containers, and <laughs> there weren't dredges for coal mining, and there weren't any of these things. Um, and to and he and then he you know he's and then we're laughing and then he said, but seriously, I mean to to to, ex, to ex, expect that there's going to be some simple fix in which we take the old ways and just apply them to this is really wrong-headed because to get to the old ways, well, you guys have to go away. You have to go and the ships have to go and refrigeration has to go and cars have to go. And he started listing all the things that had to go in order to have its, this solve happen in a way that this guy was asking him. And, you know, the, the young guy was really a great guy, and he said, no, you're, you're right. He's, and, but over said. And yet, the, if you think about the relationship between things in, the, in this regional sense, you already have your answer. You just don't want to do it. What are you, you going to do at that flat? You have your answer. You, see, you know. Oh, the light and bedroom will get a big fine. We don't want safety gear like that, Bob. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I do think that this is also something where art can do this kind of like paying attention. Like, hey, you, you know, you know what needs to be done, or you know that there is an action that's within your reach. In a lot of these questions, that there, there would be a possibility. You know, people just denying it or pushing it away. 
But everyone is leaving. Should we end? <laughs> front row. Front row. Yeah, front row. No, it's a, it's a very interesting question because I think I think right now a lot of, especially with the vitalist and animist movement, there's a and and with I would say with the breakdown of the self-evident division between life and non-life and the hierarchy of life and all that, a turn towards Jerry over a bunch of people that we that you know and I would say the West in a very crude way and I apologize. But a turn and say, well, y'all lived in relation to your environment in a way that seems from where we're standing now to be more, I don't know what word we want to use, environmentally sustainable or whatever. And I, I do think, I mean, again, I'm curious what you must have spoken with Jerry and others about this. Um, uh, but again, with over the answer really is it's like you, you're living in a fantasy. You want you want everything to stay the same, and yet you don't want the consequences of that staying the same. Right? You want to have your shipping containers. We want to have all this stuff, and and over says I want to have it too. Right? But if you want to know what we know you have to practice in the world we were practicing in and nobody wants to go back to that world so we look for a fix in which we can keep exactly how it is and yet not have the consequences and I, I, at least i think some people are calling us yeah, and I mean, I think some of these uh, things we we mentioned are also helpful there because, like, if you don't see yourself, let's say, different than the bay, if you see the bay connected to yourself, you you also take care of the bay the same like you do of your own skin, which is not something that only happens. I mean, people, uh, people. Um, you know, involved with the woods or some sort of land for a long time. Also, they don't see themselves separate. If, if one part suffers, they, uh, you know, they also suffer. So there has, a, if we would kind of like entangle this and see like which which functions are actually still intact, like a, a friend of mine or, or someone who uh, I also like to collaborate um, studies the Inuit for, um, uh, you know, why why there has been this, uh, like, um, not foreseeing the alarm systems, like uh, with the algae, or like why you, you didn't recognize that there, uh, there will be this speed up. I also think that in the tiny parts, like, for example, working on the measurements and working on, like, seismographs or, like, at a better tools for kind of predicting and anticipating certain parts of this entanglement um, could be something that wouldn't be rewinding and, and going back to the time, which we can't. And also, you know, that's not possible for the, the, the future generations. But we can still take the science for real in a way, like listen to voices where you before would have thought like, oh, you know, I don't understand uh, anything, but like maybe pay another attention, like, no, it's actually true that uh, this kind of part of the land has this ability. Are we still here? No. Okay. <laughs> oh, G'day, a... State Control of Indigenous Lands. Can I help you? Somebody even locked that bloody gate here. What? Uh, look, I don't know why somebody locked the gate. Yes. Yes, you have to have the paperwork filled out. You have to have an anthropologist go over your claim. Uh, I'm going to ask them people to go to my own country. Uh, look, look, it's the law. Own country? Well, how am I supposed to know it's your country? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I mean, I yeah, I think I do try to live uh, also this note structure. Like I, you know, I don't have a, I don't have a 
Come in and place. I'm a bit of a drifter like the algae, and I also collaborate over a long time with. I mean, okay, we're not like super long time, but let's say five years. But there are some people that I work since uh, teenage days or since art school. Or, um, so I also think, like, in, in uh, yeah, in the, in the form of life, this is something that I find very useful as a method or as a technology. I mean, you know, the people that I work with in uh, in Hollywood with the animations or um, uh, the cancer scientist. Um, or the biologist, like uh, Pedro, or I mean, Jerry actually is not a fisherman now anymore. He also works on the boats. But um, yeah, if I think I'll also try to work on these notes and on this structure with a not sustainable, but like with a more outcome, creating echo and and uh, a network. Yeah, mine might be like personal <laughs> the personal you know at the um <laughs> these kids were alive when the first one to australia and i went as a i actually as a philosopher oh okay um and their grandparents were involved in a land claim, and it ended up being one of the most contested land claims. And their parents and grandparents asked me to um, come back as a lawyer for them. And I said, no, I'm not being a lawyer. I've, I've written about this. I'm not being a lawyer. I've spent my whole life not being a lawyer. I'm not being a lawyer. Can I be something else? And they said, an anthropologist. And I said, I don't know what that is. And they said, you don't seem completely stupid. Go figure it out. Um, so, so the in some ways, I, I personally, I'm I'm entangled. Um, that was you know 1984, and it's whatever doing the number. I guess what 33 years, and and we say together. I say you know if I could have not come back here at some point, I really I I tried a couple times not to. And they use the same analytics that they use in relation to land and people and place that, that you get in each other. And then it's not a matter of choice and it's obligation in the sense, not of I feel obligated, but my, I'm materially now composed of you. Um, obligated. Uh, so, And I should say it's a very, it's also a very disruptive, and me personally, it's very disruptive in the sense that it, it entails carbon chewing travel for many, many years. But I mean, it's very disruptive. I mean, if you drift, I'm just constantly disrupted. You can't spend as much time as I do in Australia and elsewhere and consider that you're going to have what anyone would consider like we were more drifty life, let's just say. Um, but there are other kinds of, uh, of, of commitments that arise. And one is, is, um, is just the, you could say politically, but you can also say financially. Like, what does it mean to say, well, I'm effectively engaged? Well, nothing, because again, the structure of, of politics, global politics means that even though, again, those, you know, th that I've, that, that we've grown up to, I've, they were born after I had been there. They've known me forever since they've been alive. And yet, because they're indigenous and dark skinned and live in rural areas, no matter how much we love each other, their lives are continually disadvantaged while my life is continually advantaged. And then that brings into a, a very stark and unsolvable, but has to be addressed economic political question, which is what do we do about that? And, and that gets tangled up in the aesthetic question. That is, how do we make these films if that's what they want to do? And, and since I am advantaged politically and socially and economically at their disadvantage, 
And that's the entanglement. That's the, you got you, you dig. If you're going to put sand one place, it's dug from somewhere else. My advantage is dug out of them. Now, maybe not directly. My advantage is not dug out of them, but it, it is. The West is dug out of them. And so how do you take some of what was embanked in me, an unembankment, and put it back there? And that has to do with just how we financially, how we, we finance the films, what the films are about, who does what, what the purpose of the films are, and et cetera. Um, and all of that means that personally, both affect, economics, and you know, in an everyday way, um, I am irrevocably entangled over there in a way that does not solve the problem. So it's not like, and I can give you the answer to the problem in ways that are, con it's a problematic. It's not a problem that can be solved. But yeah, it's, they are, their analytics have made me and have unmade a more, I guess, typical form of life. But one I would never want anyway. Does that kind of answer the question? These films are about pulling embankment away one place and putting it in another place. And it, 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 it's where and people can travel. There's a form of like, like there's, a, there's a skinning that has happened with my colleagues or friends or family, whatever, that is quite palpable that has been made by that unembanking, reembanking, and aesthetic formation, artistic.